Great. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And I hope the next time I give a talk at CMU is actually in person. Um, cool. So uh, it's really my pleasure to be here today. And today I decided to talk about uh, simulation, which is you know one of the key pieces that is uh, really missing uh, in terms of um, uh, you know what we need to build uh, self driving cars at scale. Um, but the first thing I'm going to start doing, uh, I'm going to start with, is by giving you a 30 seconds introduction to self driving. Okay, so that we are all on the same page into how these systems work, and therefore you can there uh, then understand you know the simulation and what we do, what we do for that. Um, so in particular, if you look at you know almost every single software stack out there, the way it works is the following. First, the vehicle senses the environment, and I'm illustrating this here with a data point cloud that is seen from the top. Then, yeah, typically, uh, we localize the vehicle with precision of a few centimeters, such that you can utilize high definition maps, which provide a lot of information about the static part of the environment a priori, without even requiring to see anything. And high definition maps are, you know, particularly exciting in the sense that really extend the range of the sensors, uh, you know, far away from uh, from the vehicle. Then basically, you need to perceive everything that is, uh, you know, around the self-driving vehicle. And depending on the application domain, that range might be very large. For example, in self-driving trucks. Once you perceive what uh, what everybody is, you need to predict or hallucinate how they're going to be moving in the next few seconds. This is the task of prediction of motion forecasting. And that's important because you require this information in order to decide what is a safe maneuver that you should do uh, that is safe, is towards the goal, and is also comfortable to execute. This is the task of motion planning. And then control, basically, uh, what it does is that there is a difference, a slight difference, typically, into what you intended to execute and what the vehicle does, maybe because you don't have the right vehicle dynamics. And basically, the control system uh, brings back the vehicle to what was the intended execution. So this process is repeated every fraction of a second, typically every 100 milliseconds or so, because that's sort of the frequency uh, that you have the sensors coming in, the sensor data coming in. Cool. So in a nutshell, almost every single self-driving uh, uh, car system works this way, so driving vehicle system works this way, particularly in industry. Now, you know, it's been, we've seen a lot of exciting progress over the past, say, you know, two decades, right? And a lot of investment that has gone into the self driving industry since the DARPA days, which is now 17 years ago, right? More than 20 billion or so in direct investment. Um, however, you know, we are still quite far from the promised land of seeing self driving vehicles everywhere. And in my opinion, there is, uh, you know, big technological changes that need to come in order to really build this technology in a way uh, that you can really scale and generalize to solve you know, all the complex long tail uh, problems of things that can happen in the world. So and in particular, um, this new uh, generation or revolution of self-driving, what I call self-driving 2.0, there is like two key components that uh, you know, we need to do much better than what is out there in systems. On one side, we need a better autonomy system, right? The brain of the self-driving car that can really solve all these long tails. And as I said, I can really generalize to very different geographies, times of the day, etc., weather conditions. And then we need also new technology to really provide a real-time high fidelity closed loop simulator uh, that will enable us to both test uh, the full autonomous system in a way that you know, we can really reliably uh, believe the, uh, you know, the, uh, the results of those tests, right? And that it correlates uh, fully with what happens in the real world. And at the same time, um, we need uh, this technology in order to potentially train, you know, the AI systems that compose, uh, you know, the autonomous system. And in particular, as we go towards more and more AI focused approaches from a robotics first approach to an AI first approach, uh, this simulator becomes even more important. Now today, I'm going to be focusing, as I mentioned, on uh, the simulator, uh, simulation part. Okay, so uh, bear with me. I love autonomy, but uh, it's not going to be today. Cool. So I'm going to be trying to answer uh, or give some answers to the following two questions. How can we test uh, the autonomous system? Okay, that's the first question. 
And the second one is how can we train in such that we can actually handle everything that might happen in our operation domain. And the concept of operation domain is particularly important in self-driving because we shouldn't think of, you know, self-driving cars are going to be, you know, working in every single uh, place at the same time. Instead, the way that this technology is going to be deployed, we will see, you know, small areas uh, where these vehicles are actually operating and then they will expand over time. And over time might be many, many years. Okay, so this concept of where they actually drive is very, very important. Now, if we look at how uh, self-driving vehicles are tested, uh, there is really three different types of methodologies. And it's not that it's a choice between using, you know, one of these methodologies, it's that typically, you know, the big industry players, uh, they use a combination of these three things. Okay. So these are structured testing, real world replay and simulation. So let me explain what these things are. Um, you know, in structured testing, basically what you do is you have your vehicles um, uh, go through a series of repeatable tests that are very, very structured, meaning that every time that you want to test uh, a particular release of your software, uh, you basically have the vehicles doing exactly the same test. Super, super reproducible. So it has very high fidelity. Also, you are testing this in the uh, typically a test track. Um, and you're testing the full system, meaning that it's actually reactive, right? So this is actually good in terms of the fidelity uh, uh, of how you're testing the system. Now, if you think about, you know, having or preparing a specific test on a test track, it requires a lot of human effort plus your dummies, right? And means that uh, this is not going to be very scalable. Typically, you know, the maximum number of tests that you can do in a day is 100 or so. On top of this, you can't really test everything that is safety critical, right? In the sense that, uh, you know, if you're going to simulate accidents every time you have a, uh, if you're going to, sorry, uh, have the, uh, you know, test, uh, you know, what, how your vehicle will, uh, will behave with respect to accidents uh, with every, uh, every single software release, right? This is going to be very expensive and potentially unethical. So, so we need something different as well. One of the most, uh, useful or use, uh, uh, I guess, ways to test the driving vehicles is with lock replay. And the, the idea is very simple, is you can take any of the logs that you have recorded by previously driving, you know, on, you know, whatever areas that you are interested in. And then you can look at how the new software release behaves compared to the previous software, uh, previous software release. Um, this gives you, you know, it has very high fidelity in terms of the sensor uh, configuration because you're just going to exploit the data that you recorded. So you have your cameras, your laser that represent really the real world. Um, it's not reactive in the sense that because you use information that, that was already captured, you can not really generate new information, right? The new software stack is going to potentially change the behavior with respect to what it was doing before but you will not be able to update how the sensors might have observed the scene. So in that sense, it's also not realistic. And um, it's, it's scalable in the sense that, uh, you know, you can use as much information as the one that you have actually observed in your logs, uh, but you can't go beyond what you observe. And in terms of safety critical, well, uh, you can test as many safety, safety critical cases as you observe in the real world, but not more. Now, the way of testing self driving vehicles that I'm particularly very excited about, and I think is really uh, where the future is, is by using simulation. Okay, and I'm showing you here a video of uh, you know, one of our simulators that I will show you later today. Um, the idea of uh, you know, simulation is that you, know, you can recreate the world and basically test every possible scenario that might, have ha might happen in the real world. So, uh, you know, in general, this has the ability to, to be very scalable. However, current solutions are not necessarily scalable. It's also reactive in the sense that uh, if you are able to simulate the sensors, you can really test the entire autonomy stack. So you're going to be, you know, reactive, and the, you know, the next observation of the uh, of the sensors will be based on how you actually behave on your action. Uh, you can test safety critical cases because there is no danger here. And the problem is that typically, uh, you know, if you look at simulators out there, they are not high fidelity. So this, you know, typical simulators do not give you a lot of information or a lot of signal into how your system actually behaves uh, once the system is actually pretty performed. 
So, so in today's talk, I guess I will talk about this last piece, simulation, right? And talk about, uh, you know, the different uh, sub pieces that you need in order to be, to build the best in class simulator. Now you, you know, you probably have heard of many companies out there that they talk about, oh, we, you know, we drive millions of billions of miles in simulation, right? So what they uh, really mean is the following. So here is the software stack, right? Yes, uh, lay out for you. And when, when they see that they test so many miles on simulation, what they mean is that they start with a representation of the scene that is, uh, you know, uh, represented with bounding boxes and trajectories. And they're only gonna test the motion planning module. So this has two problems, right? One is that you're not really testing the full software stack. So it's not that you can use this technology alone to certify your system. On top of this, the way that the input to the motion planning is done is that typically these are nearly optimal you know, trajectories and there is very you know, simplistic noise uh, that is added. So as a consequence, even for the uh, motion planning model that you're trying to test, you are not really fully testing it because you don't have the characteristics of all the things that can go wrong in your real perception and prediction system. Okay, so we need something better. Now, ideally, what you would like to have is a system where if you are able to simulate how the sensors observe the scene, then you basically can test the full software stack. Okay, and this is the approach that we are going to be uh, tackling today. And then the question is, well, how can we do this in a way that is scalable, that is super fast, that is very high fidelity, uh, and we can do this at a scale such that, you know, we can test everything possible uh, that might happen to our cell driving people. All right, so, so you, you know, if I convince you that, you know, doing closed loop simulation uh, is, uh, is actually, you know, the way to go, uh, there is really four different pieces of technology that we need. On one side, if you want to simulate how the, the sensors will have observed the scene, you need to understand or know how the world looks like in the first place, right? So we need some technology that, right, that is able to generate virtual worlds. Also, if you want to test particular things uh, of you know, how this, uh, uh, basically, your vehicle behaves, you need to generate scenarios. And these scenarios, uh, you know, basically, uh, you can think of them as you know, which actors are in the scene, how are they behaving, et cetera. Now, on top of this, you need to create the behaviors of all the act actors in the scene, such as, the, such as they're realistic and uh, they basically perform as humans might actually be driving in the world. And then the last piece that you need is that once you have, you know, all your assets, you can generate the specific scenarios, you can run the scenarios so that you, know, you are reactive, then you basically need to simulate how the sensors will have observed that scene. Okay, so we need sensor simulation that goes across different sensors, and again, it's very realistic. All right, so let's see uh, where the industry is in, this different, in these four different pieces of technology and what we have done in order to push the needle forward uh, in this. So let's start with uh, how we can generate these virtual worlds. Now, if you look at you know, uh, companies out there, um, the, the way that they typically generate uh, these assets, which are you know, the background as well as the different vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, et cetera, is that they actually hire humans, artists, uh, to basically uh, generate uh, these, uh, these assets. And then they use a very, you know, typically very simplistic procedural modeling or rules-based systems uh, to basically compose our bigger world out of these small pieces. Now, this is going to be, you know, very time consuming and very expensive because you have to pay humans to actually create these assets. And typically uh, you have, you know, a smaller scale and you don't have the diversity of appearance of the real world. Um, so you need, you know, you need a, an approach that is basically fundamentally different from this. Now, our approach is very, uh, very intuitive and it's based on the following idea, which is that, you know, you can just drive around the world. You can collect the uh, information about the world by simply, you know, recording your, your sensor data. And then you can automatically build how the world looks like uh, from this raw sensor data information. Okay, so, so basically what it means is that given LiDAR, cameras, radar, etc., right? we need to be able to reconstruct every single area that you drive in, basically the static part of the environment, every single vehicle that you observe, 
as well as you know, every single pedestrian uh, that you observe as you drive. Okay, and the question is, how can we use you know, the latest, greatest uh, AI such that we can do all this automatically at the scale? Now, if you look at the background, this is actually the easiest thing to reconstruct. Right, because the, the thing that you need is uh, to be able to create or, or to have very accurate uh, pose for the ego vehicle as it drives, so that you can accumulate the evidence of everything that is static. And then on top of this, what you need to do is use your favorite, typically, uh, you know, point cloud segmentation in order to basically remove all the objects that you don't want in the static part because potentially they might be moving um, and basically just yes, correcting your, uh, corrupting your data. Okay, so this is something that you can do fairly easily. Now, let's look into how we can create dynamic um, assets. And first, we're going to start with uh, assets that are rigid uh, because they are easier to reconstruct. And then I'm going to show you how to reconstruct uh, animatable pedestrians, which are you know, uh, much more difficult than if you look at vehicles. Now, what I'm showing you here is, you know, I mentioned before that uh, you know, typically, if you do this with CAD models, you don't have a lot of diversity. Um, here I'm showing you, you know, some of the assets that we reconstruct by just driving around, and you see that the world has a lot of diversity, uh, not just with respect to the particular and the make or model uh, of the vehicle, but also in terms of, you know, all the different things that, uh, you know, whether the you know, doors are open, the vehicle is carrying some stuff, uh, etc. Right? And we want to reconstruct all this uh, diversity, as I mentioned before. All right, so let's see how we can do this. Now, so what you need to do, right, is that you have your sensor data, right, that you have captured by driving around. So you have your point clouds and you have your uh, images, right? And from this, we want to basically create three-dimensional models of the world with texture, right? So that we can also uh, potentially uh, do camera simulation, not just simulation of, uh, of the data, right? And now one of the difficulties that we have here is that we don't necessarily have a priori uh, models uh, or data where we have uh, the sensor data as well as the uh, uh, desired shape, right? So we need to design a self-supervised method that is able to do this, uh, you know, from raw data without having access to any a priori information. Um, so in terms of the model that we develop, is it's actually quite simple and it lies on the principle that uh, if you look at vehicles, you typically can think of a vehicle as, uh, you know, the space of vehicles have some kind of, you know, mean configuration, right? Um, in this case, the mean shape. And then every particular vehicle is basically a deformation with respect to this mean shape, right? So this gives you sort of the shape of the vehicle. And then we need to also estimate the pose, right? Because as we drive along, the relationship between our ego car and every vehicle we observe is changing over time. Right, so we have, you know, per lidar sweep or per image a different pose that we need to estimate. And basically the way that we, uh, we obtain this uh, automatically is by casting this as an energy minimization problem, where we say that uh, we want to reconstruct the, or explain the evidence that we have from the lidar, right? So, and we can use something like, for example, chamfer distance to quantize how well, uh, how good a shape is with respect to what we observe uh, with our later data, as well as uh, we look at uh, uh, information or energy terms of the form of we would like the silhouette uh, of uh, the projection into the images of our ve uh, vehicle that we estimate to be as close as possible to basically the segmentation that we can obtain uh, from the image data. Okay, so you basically create an energy problem by summing all these terms. And then you optimize across the whole data set for the mean shape as well as the individual predicted shapes and poses for all the vehicles. And what is key for this is that you need to employ a differentiable renderer so that we, you can actually do this with, uh, for example, gradient based uh, approaches. And it turns out that this approach actually works uh, remarkably well. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, reconstructions uh, of uh, different vehicles. Uh, where you also observe, uh, in this case, we have a texture map uh, mapping to them. Okay, and you see that, you know, very accurately you can reconstruct, you know, a wide variety of uh, of these uh, assets. Now, the one of the things that was, you know, useful uh, for vehicles is the fact that 
you know, vehicles, sort of, they all look relatively similar, right? And the shape doesn't vary over time. This is not the case for other, uh, other objects, for example, deformable objects like uh, uh, pedestrians, right? And what is uh, interesting about pedestrians is that not only we are interested in reconstructing how, um, you know, their shape is, because, um, right, uh, but also we are interested in uh, reconstructing the skeleton underneath every one of these humans, as well as the skinny weights, such that we can reanimate a human to do any possible activity later on in our simulator, right? Otherwise, if we only reconstructed the shape, we will only be able to pose the pedestrians to do exactly the same as they were doing in the real world. And that will not be as scalable as we would like to do. Can I ask you Yes, go ahead. Um, I mean, why, why do you need to get the three-dimensional shape of a specific human? I mean, aren't we all the same as, as far as, uh, except maybe for height and maybe overall girth? Uh, yeah, not at all. So the, you want to test the uh, performance of the uh, perception system and how it affects the full software stack as a function of the variability of obvious in the world. And there are certain types of you know, shapes and things that actually fool the system more than others. Uh, so it's important that you can reconstruct all this diversity so you can actually test potentially you know, all, the, all the issues. And this together with adversarial examples, right? Um, adversarial techniques is super, super powerful in terms of finding where your system fails. But you need the ability to have this diversity in the first place. I see. I see. And sort of for the follow on to something that posted in the chat, um, you earlier showed some models where, you know, there were trunks of the vehicle open and mm -hmm. things like that. But I, I thought none of those examples, the reconstructed, the very nice reconstruction you showed in the last slide. So is there a gap still there in terms of handling these things which have maybe, you know, yeah. trunk is open or the hood is open, or maybe it's missing, you know, it's convertible and the roof is ripped off or something like that. Yeah, yeah, so you catch me. So, um, so we have to, I mean, we have built, I guess, three versions or generations of this technology. We have one where we can actually reconstruct this very complex shapes with the trunks and whatnot, uh, but we don't have a good way to generate texture yet. Um, when we want texture as well as uh, we want, uh, you know, 3D shape, uh, then the, you know, our current approach uh, uh, is, doesn't uh, handle all the sophistications of the real world. Uh, so next generation that we are doing now actually will be able to handle both. Uh, but yeah, yeah. great, uh, great eye. Whoever made a comment, super. Cool. Um, um, Raquel, actually there's yeah. a question in the, in the chat that basically asks, uh, why not use library of known car shapes maybe with some augmentation instead of just sensor data uh, driven models? Yeah, typically uh, CAD models are not super realistic and you don't have all the variability of the real world. If you look at, uh, you know, what I was showing here, right, you don't have this kind of, you know, assets typically. Um, and instead here, you know, or, you know, you don't have the uh, level of sophistication of the shapes. Okay, so in, and I will show you some results later on when I get to the later simulator that when you use CAD models, you actually get to much more results than if you use these assets. Thank you. So, Cool, great question too. All right, so, so now let's look into the pedestrians, right? So we wanna reconstruct every single person that you have observed in the world, uh, as well as the uh, skeleton, the skin in weights, so that you can use, you know, LVS or, you know, your favorite uh, technique to basically reanimate with all the deformations as you see over here. Okay. And these are actually reconstructions from a single leader sweep and a single image. And of course, it's important that you don't bias your reconstructions, meaning that it has to work for all sizes, all shapes, all genders, etc. Okay, and that's important. Here I'm just showing a, I guess, a woman uh, that was running, right, and how we can reconstruct and then basically uh, reanimate to do any particular activity we want. All right, so let's look at how we can actually do these reconstructions. So now I want to use a very different type of technique. We're going to be looking at implicit representations here. Okay, and one thing that uh, disclaimer here is that before we could do everything self-supervised, for humans it's much more difficult. We have tried in the past, but you don't get the level of precision that you know in the results that I showed you here. Okay, so let's let's see what we can do. 
Um, so we're going to use, as I said, a single image as well as a, a single data strip. And then basically we're going to learn some representations with your favorite backbone. And as I mentioned, we're going to for, form uh, you know, an implicit representation such that, which is local in the sense that you can query. Uh, for a given 3D point, you can compute this uh, feature representation by basically projecting and indexing into the 2D backbone features as well as by indexing and using you know, three linear sampling in uh, the 3D, uh, 3D feature backbone that process the later point clouds. Uh, you can also encode some additional information about the geometry. And this gives you a particular representation for a point. And then given this particular representation, the next thing that you need to do is basically you have a set of headers that are going to predict post field that is a probability distribution over the uh, distribution of the different joints and occupancy field telling you what is the probability of a boxer being occupied versus not, uh, I mean a box at a particular point, sorry, as well as a uh, skin field uh, that tells you for that point how is uh, distributed in terms of the different joints. Okay. Now, um, so this is, you know, all a single network, right? And then basically you can actually do inference by doing one more step, which is uh, you can create your skeleton by doing sim a simple Rmax operation in your post field. You can do uh, get your uh, shape by basically doing meshing uh, on top of the occupancy field. And on top of the, uh, this, uh, uh, basically, you can uh, query in the shape given by the mesh, your skinning weights, and you will, what you will be doing is just basically painting your shape such that you can later reanimate this particular shape, okay? And uh, this is, you know, the three uh, key components that you need in order to be able to do this reanimation, okay? And as I said here, we use, you know, a version of the, an enhanced version of the LBS model for this. Um, the other thing that is, uh, you know, interesting here is that, um, so this, um, maybe one thing to note is that this thing here is actually just marching cubes. Um, and you can train the system uh, end to end right, uh, where basically uh, here we use uh, synthetic data to train the system and it's going to generalize to the real world. Um, and basically we have, you know, a loss function in terms of the pose, a loss function in terms of the occupancy, which is in this case, just yes, cross entropy, right, because we use uh, probabilities here. And then uh, basically a loss function also in terms of the skinny weights. Um, so in order to train the system, we use the uh, uh, render people data set, uh, which is a fantastic data set uh, to work uh, you know, on human and human animation. And on top of this, uh, we create yes, arbitrary animations from the Mixamo uh, data. Now uh, let's look at how this actually compares to other approaches. So it's actually, um, you know, works really well in practice compared in this case, uh, I'm showing you two of the most you know, popular approaches to uh, pedestrian reconstruction, which is the spin and people models, right? And uh, whether, you know, for the same type of poses that you see in the training set versus uh, different types of poses. And also in this case, uh, you know, the testing set is different characters than, than the training set. Um, so, so one of the things to notice is that we, if we only use images, it's already a performing the state of the art. And if we actually use the later information, uh, which we can very simply generate here by mimicking how the later works, right, uh, on this data set, uh, then you actually get a much better performance. Uh, you can also look at uh, how well you can reanimate. Um, and the way that you can do this is you reconstruct your shape, your skeleton, and your skinny weights. And then you basically pose that, uh, that uh, reconstruction into a different pose and you look at um, what will be the, the difference with respect to uh, you know, the grand truth. And, and one of the things to note here is that again, uh, using later is much better in terms of uh, you know, the reconstruction, the skin, et cetera. And in general, uh, you know, that's a very good, uh, w uh, good job at uh, generalizing across all the different poses as you simply post the, the actor in, 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 this, in these different poses. Cool. So, then we can just apply this without any changes, with no domain adaptation to the real world. And this is what I'm showing you here. Um, on the, I'm just going to show you the image, not the later, okay, just to not clutter too much. But here are your, you know, humans that uh, we observe as we drive around. And you can see the predicted skeleton, the predicted mesh, 
and then we're going to reanimate this in a different pose. Okay. And then you see here, you know, the complexity and differences of the real world, how we can actually reconstruct backpacks, hoodies, hats, uh, right, which, you know, make the shape of the human actually look uh, pretty different, right? And uh, as I mentioned, all this from a single image and a single data suite. Okay, so this allows you to really create a very large uh, data set of uh, assets for, uh, you know, the pedestrians that you observe in the real world. Okay, and then we can use this for uh, simulation later on. All right, so, so now we have uh, seen how we can generate these virtual worlds automatically from real uh, data, right? And now we're gonna look at how we generate uh, scenarios given all those assets, okay? So there is, uh, if you look at the, the industry, there is like three different ways that you can generate these scenarios. Um, for typically for safety folks or system engineer folks, they like to actually create very specific scenarios because they wanna test one specific thing. So they, they like to use, you know, your simple GUIs to, to create this by hand. Another popular technique is to use, you know, logs that have been labeled to, to basically just import how different actors move and then you create a scenario this way. And what I'm gonna show you next is how we can actually use, uh, you know, AI in order to build a generative model of these scenarios. Right, so in particular, what we're interested in doing is that given, you know, the map as well as the configuration of the self-driving car, we want to populate the world in a way that we create a traffic scene that is realistic, that basically captures or could be sampled uh, from any uh, of the real world data that we have observed or we could observe in the world. Okay. And in particular, it's important to know that you need to do this in a multi-class setting, meaning that you want to generate pedestrians, uh, vehicles, as well as uh, humans. So let's see how we can do this. Um, in particular, we're going we're gonna to actually do this in, in a pretty simplistic way, but works very well in practice, which is the following. Oh, sorry, before I go this, um, let me show you what the industry does, and then I will tell you what, uh, what we do. So if you look at the industry, uh, one of the most common used ways to do this is with really heuristics where you have your you know, vehicles that go uh, basically um, you know, in the middle of the road, uh, always facing the same as the lane, et cetera. Or you use very simple automation with, again, procedural modeling or, or very simplistic rule-based systems to, to create these scenarios. So, so this, again, doesn't give you really diversity of the real world. Right? So we need something more sophisticated. So let's see how we can do this. Uh, so simply we're going to do this with a uh, convolutional STM, right, that is going to be drawing, um, you know, in a recurring manner, one actor at a time. Um, and simply it's going to be, you know, learn this from a small amount of data. Okay, so the idea is that we have a representation of the scene so far with the map as well as whatever actors we have, in this case the SDB. Then uh, we use this convol STM to provide a distribution into what should be the next thing to sample. Okay, then we sample from this, so here is uh, this particular bicycle, and then we feed this again to the, uh, to the Combell STM, and then we continue generating this uh, you know, as we go uh, this scene. Okay, so it turns out that this actually works really well in practice. So I'm showing you, uh, you know, a whole bunch of uh, um, you know, different techniques here from probabilistic grammars to procedural modeling. Uh, Lane graphs are more of these heuristic based systems. Uh, you know, VAEs, you name it. And it turns out that, you know, such a simplistic approach actually does really, really well in terms of log likelihood, but also does very well in terms of uh, MND for uh, the feature representations, as well as, you know, some of the statistics of the, uh, of the objects that you are generating in terms of, you know, the location, class, size, etc. Okay, so, um, so this actually, as I said, works, uh, works very well in practice. Um, now, what is more important than showing you, you know, good statistics or whatnot, right, is the fact that you can employ this technique to generate arbitrary amounts of training data, right? So together with the assets that I showed you before, uh, so we can generate the scenario, we can uh, import the asset, uh, which is, you know, this three-dimensional representation, and we can train our perception system. And it turns out that, um, and this actually, uh, you know, the way that we generate uh, these scenarios uh, matters a lot in practice in terms of uh, for you to be able to build uh, detectors that are much more performant. Uh, so not only, you know, you get better statistics, it looks more realistic, 
uh, it actually does matter in practice. Okay, and here the only thing that changes is actually the generation approach. Everybody uses the same assets as well as this, the same later simulation uh, to create the, the data set. Cool, so let me show you this with a video now. Um, and as you can see here, so the, I'm showing you a slowdown speed. Obviously the Campbell STR is much faster than this, uh, but you can see you know, how it is uh, basically generating the different actors. So we generate their positions, their orientations, as well as things like you know, their velocity profiles. Okay? And you can generate you know, very, uh, you know, pretty realistic uh, configurations uh, here, like uh, you know, park cars that you saw one over here, or these guys over here, as well as uh, different objects going around, right? One of the things that, you know, it captures pretty nicely is like typically humans go in groups, um, uh, which is, you know, more difficult to do with these heuristics. Cool. All right, so, so, um, so we're gonna pass to the, now to the next, uh, next step, which is now we have the kind of initial scenario. Now we need to unroll this scenario over time in a way that reflects how a traffic scene will actually behave, right? And we're going to do this through uh, a sophisticated way to do simulating behaviors. So let's see how, how we can do this. Um, and again, the first thing I'm going to tell you is how this actually typically is done in, in industry or this uh, you know, simulation companies as well as driving companies. Um, so again, uh, they use typically the same type of uh, rule-based procedural modeling uh, stuff where it's super, super scripted, uh, meaning, you know, the vehicle does this at this point and then does this and then something else, right? Um, and if you think of, you know, the complexity of the real world, we don't behave that way, right? We are actually quite, you know, unpredictable, right? So there's quite a long tails of, of behavior for humans. All right, so, so they also use, you know, very simplistic uh, models like trajectory follower or just doing ACC or things like this, so that, you know, the simulation doesn't collide between the different actors. So let's look at how we can do this in a more sophisticated way. Um, so we're going to build an autoregressive model, right? Where we're going to start with, you know, we have already simulated, you know, a chunk or can be the initialization, right? And we're interested in simulating this over time for long periods of time, okay? And long periods, I mean, you know, 20 seconds, one minute, something like this. And it's actually pretty difficult to do so. Um, the information that we're going to exploit is information about the maps as well as information about, uh, traffic, which we can, you know, for example, very simply encode with uh, rasterization based approaches. And then together with the actual trajectories of the actors, right, we will use this information to basically unroll one step to create the next, uh, you know, the simulation in the next frame. And then we will change the representation here, right, of the past actors because we have seen one more step. And then we will generate the next configuration, etc. Okay, and this is, you know, you can do this by unrolling many steps, unrolling a single step. This is up to you how you want to trade off the computation versus fidelity. Okay, and the question is, well, what is a method or a way to actually generate this in a way that when we unroll this, uh, we get very realistic behaviors for very complicated scenes with many actors that, you know, are supposed to interact with each other. Um, so in particular, we are going to look at a, um, uh, doing this through a uh, distributed latent variable model um, that is able to capture the relationship between the different actors and at the same time is super efficient in terms of the uh, the time of unrolling these steps because you need to do you know behavioral simulations just one piece of this complex simulation system that we are building all right, so, so we're going to use, again, your favorite way of encoding trajectories. In this case, uh, we simply use your use uh, to create, you know, this is the past trajectories, right, to create this motion context uh, uh, vector. And then we're going to use uh, also our, you know, favorite, this is based on detection plus prediction. This is based on our autonomous systems. For those of you that have seen some of our papers, uh, where basically we can do, we can encode the map and do a ROI pooling in the location of the actors to create uh, the representation of every one of the vehicles within, which is in this case within our simulation. Okay, and given this information, basically um, we are going to use a graph neural network that passes messages or information between the map, the actors, and the actors between themselves. Okay, and uh, with this message passing, uh, basically it's capturing all the inherent relationships uh, 
uh, and interactions between between all these things. Okay. Now uh, this is going to create our latent representation, which we can sample from it, and then we have a deterministic decoder uh, that simply, uh, which is again a, <clears throat> a graph neural network, which simply creates the next unrolled uh, steps for the simulation. Okay. So let's see how this works in practice. Uh, sorry, before I say that, uh, um, let's see how to train the system and then how this works in practice. Uh, so it turns out that everything here is differentiable, uh, so that's great. So we can actually, you know, backpropagate through time here. Um, and in terms of the loss function, we use a combination of two things. Uh, imitation loss, because you want to generate data that looks like what the real world is. And then we have this common sense loss that basically says that if you sample from the prior or the posterior, everything that you sample should be reasonable, meaning you shouldn't shoot off the, off the road and you shouldn't collide with uh, other objects. Um, and it turns out that this actually works really well in practice. And for those of you that are thinking, why isn't this a motion forecasting task? Why can I use my favorite prediction system? Um, so these are you know, some of the most popular uh, prediction systems. So if you unroll them for you know, sufficient enough steps, which are not a lot, basically they fail miserably. Okay, they, uh, they go totally out of distribution and then they end up with behaviors that uh, look pretty bad. So that's actually not, uh, you know, something that works well. You can use your uh, favorite imitation learning approach um, and also it doesn't work very well. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, our approach that I has mentioned before is actually um, the best compromise in terms of, you know, how well it works uh, in terms of, you know, this is how it satisfies the rules of traffic for not colliding as well as not going off the road, etc. cetera. Um, and at the same time, it imitates pretty well what humans uh, will have done in that scene. Cool, so let me show you some video of how, how this works. Um, so here, you're, uh, what I'm showing you is uh, simply unrollings of, uh, of the simulation. And as you can, you know, and I'm sure that you could have believed that these were actually labels in your data set, right? It's actually really, really realistic how the behavior of all these actors uh, work. And this is a generative model, so we can actually sample, you know, arbitrary amount of times to create, uh, to create these uh, simulations. Um, now, the, the next thing I'm going to highlight is the fact that we can actually simulate complex behaviors without any rules or anything. Um, so I'm going to highlight four things. In this case, it's a notch. Uh, that, as you saw, look very, very realistic, uh, a U-turn. And look here how it's capturing the behavior of, I'm going to wait for this person to pass, and then I'm going to do my U-turn, right? But again, without really hard coding any of the stuff. And here is doing a line change, again, very, very naturalistic. And the last one is an unprotected left, which is one of the most difficult uh, things to simulate. And again, looks very, very uh, realistic with respect to what a human would have done. Um, maybe it's worth showing this uh, here, which is, you know, if you look at some of the, you know, prediction-based systems, they actually very quickly do all sorts of stuff if you simulate for a long, uh, long enough uh, timestamps. Uh, even, you know, the most sophisticated ones, uh, they still go to collisions and they do, you know, they shoot out of the, uh, of the road. So, so yes, using prediction systems is actually not sufficient. Uh, however, our traffic simulation, um, you know, is very, very realistic. Cool. So the last thing I'm going to show you is how we can actually simulate the sensors now. Okay, so now we have generated all the scenarios, all the behaviors, right? Now we need to be able to see to say or to generate the data that the vehicle would have observed with respect to the scene in front of us, right? So let's see how we can do sensor simulation in real time and very, very uh, precisely. Cool, so as I said, putting together, we have the assets, we have the static part of the environment, we can create the specific scenarios with the behaviors, right? And now we need to create how the sensors will have observed the scene. Uh, so let's start with later. Um, so in terms of LIDAR, what we use is a combination of, uh, for the LIDAR simulation, a combination of uh, AI and, and physics. Um, so in particular, you can use ray casting uh, to basically tell you, uh, you know, by shooting rays of, uh, you know, the returns uh, so that you, you have three-dimensional point cloud, right? And that's actually pretty good, but it's not super realistic in the sense that it doesn't capture the noise of uh, typical LIDARs. So what uh, in particular we do here is that we enhance this by um, tackling one specific type of, type of noise, which is the fact that not all the, 
race that you uh, that you send actually return and it's a combination of many things whether it's the power the incident angle whether it's the specific material the distance etc that um, you know uh, are factors in this fact and it's actually really hard to model this in a way that you know with all the proper physics and whatnot instead we are, we use you know our favorite sort of architecture to uh, decide whether a race will return versus not and this is the way that the network actually learns, yes, by looking at, you know, uh, the environment into uh, whether it should be the case or, uh, you know, this, this ratio should, should not be uh, considered. And this is actually important in terms of, you know, increasing the fidelity of our simulation. Cool. So, so someone was mentioning before into, okay, are, you know, CAD models or whatever good enough? Um, so here we're showing some results with respect to um, semantic segmentation on Kitty. Um, where um, uh, we train the system either uh, using our simulator or the Carla simulator. And one thing to note is that there is a huge reality, uh, sorry, a huge fidelity gap uh, for, you know, using, for example, Carla with CAD models. And there is uh, almost no fidelity gap, right? We are almost working the same as uh, real uh, for our case, right? It's, it's simply just a 1% difference um, in terms of uh, semantic segmentation in our IUU. So it's much more realistic than using those, those other assets that, that you, you guys were asking before. Um, we can do the same thing in the sense of we can actually train systems using the LIDAR simulator. Um, so if you only use LIDAR simulation, right, so you get actually pretty decent detectors. Um, if you use a small amount of examples and only the real data, you know, is worse. Um, and you can combine a small amount of real data with the uh, simulated data to get boosting performance. And uh, what you observe is diminishing returns, right? The more real data that you have, the least uh, you get a boost in terms of the uh, simulation. Okay, but uh, you know it can it sort of plateaus uh, nicely here. And here we are not doing anything special into how we are actually creating the data. So I think that these numbers can actually be pushed quite quite large uh, uh, if we actually do something more reasonable. Cool. So let's see this with uh, with some pictures. On the left hand side, you see the LIDAR simulation. Uh, on the right hand side, you see the real leader. Uh, these are persons. Uh, and one thing to see is that, okay, the leader looks pretty similar, but more important in green is the output of the perception system. Uh, so for the perception system, whether it's simulation or whether it's real, basically it's observing the same thing. So, it, you know, it fully correlates. And this is the reason why you can really test the perception system uh, or the full autonomy stack with this, uh, uh, with this methodology. And the, then we, you can put all this together and basically create, you know, specific scenarios here. Uh, where what we're doing here is that this is the reconstructed scene with the reconstructed assets, right? And basically, uh, we are creating a scenario where somebody is coming out of occlusion, which is one of the safety critical things that you need to test your just that your system can do. And the input to the uh, autonomy system is the simulation. Right, and as you can see, uh, we can test that the system actually reacts and it slows down for uh, the vehicle that is incorporated. Okay, so this is a way that you can create this test. And then you can do this at the scale because everything has been done automatically here, right? Different geographies, different configurations of the particular scenarios that you wanna, uh, you wanna test, etc. Cool, so, so let me uh, show you a little bit about how you can do camera, uh, camera simulation. And if we have time, I have one more thing that I think is quite interesting to, sh to show you. Um, so in terms of the camera simulator, um, what I'm gonna show you uh, today is uh, GeoSim, um, which is a way to do camera simulation, which scales really well and is super, super realistic. And in particular, what we're gonna do here is that we are gonna collect raw data or use logs that we have collected before. And we're gonna insert fake objects that weren't there in the first place on those logs. And these inserted objects are gonna be in 3D so that we can also simulate the later. And they're gonna be aware of occlusions. And they're gonna be, we're gonna simulate video. So they have to be nicely consistent over time. Okay. So we want to generate something that is photorealistic, that is aware of traffic, that is you know, physically realistic in 3D, and so that you, you handle occlusions properly. Okay, so let's see how we can do this. Oops, and I'm missing one slide, I guess. 
Um, so the, the way that we're going to do this is basically we're going to utilize the reconstruction of the asset I showed you before, and we're going to use um, yeah, we're going to render the scene, and we're going to use an additional neural net to correct for the mistakes of this render. Okay, and this actually uh, works really well in practice. And this correction is not just about you know getting the edges right and whatnot, but also is correcting for the uh, illumination, uh, shadows, and things like this. Okay, cool. So I'm going to show you a video now where we are going to see um, two times the same video. Okay, and the goal is for you to identify which of these objects are actually fake. And there is like four or five fake objects per video. And some of them are actually pretty difficult to, to identify, like the one that just passed, right? Some are easier, like this guy here, the illumination is slightly off, right? So like this guy, right? So it's actually easier to see. You know, some in the background are fake. I, I can't really say which ones are anymore. Uh, this guy in front of us is fake. You will never have to say that, right? At the end, you see a little bit of flickering, but um, in general, it's super, super realistic, right? And as I mentioned, this is in 3D, which means that it's compatible uh, with uh, the fact that we can actually simulate the laser as well as the cameras. And this is very important. And also we can simulate uh, multiple cameras, not just a single camera. And let me show you the multiple cameras. So here you can see that simulating, you know, how if we place multiple cameras on top of the car, how we will have observed the scene in a way that again uh, is consistent in truth. Cool. So let's see. So if I have, uh, I think I have five minutes. So hopefully uh, I can show you this, which is the following. Um, now that, uh, you know, we have the simulator, right, we can actually, you know, test uh, the software stack and train the software stack, right? So that's great. However, if you look at, you know, the, the progression of autonomous systems is that, you know, over time, they're supposed to get better and better, right? And if you look at the typical test that you, you make your system go through, you know, most of the tests, if not all, at some point, you're going to pass, right? And the question is, and this test can be, you know, very large number. You might have, you know, one million tests, right, in the simulator. And one of the things that, you know, you, th you need to start thinking about is, well, now that I'm passing all my tests, does this mean that actually my system is perfectly safe and it will never crash or do something that is, you know, it shouldn't be doing, right? Do we have a knowledge, a notion of, do we cover actually everything, right? So, so in the case of, you know, these, these very good systems, if you just randomly sample the scenarios, it's gonna take you a very long time to find, you know, these failure, failure modes, right? Instead, we need some tooling or some other ways to identify where the system actually fails. And, and you know where, I, where I'm going, right? So you can use adversarial techniques, right, in order to generate the scenarios that will make your server stack fail. And it's important that you build techniques uh, for adversarial attacks that can work for any software stack, regardless of whether it's differentiable or not differentiable, whether it's AI based or whatever, right? Um, so in order to do this, we're actually gonna exploit again our simulator. And the way that we're gonna do this is that, you know, given a particular scenario, and you have the observations of that scenario as well as, you know, where uh, the different actors are, we are going to perturb certain actors, can be a subset, can be all, can be one, right? Such that given that perturbation, our system has higher probability of failure. Okay, so in order to do this, what we need to do is to be able to regenerate, given that perturbation, right? Given that we are actually modifying how the objects are, we need to regenerate the scene pass it through the autonomous system, right, to the autonomous system, and then see, you know, how well we perform, right? And we wanna generate these adversarial behaviors such that the cost here is very, very high, meaning that we will actually be creating a scenarios that our system cannot handle. And as I mentioned before, we're gonna use black box optimization, right, such that uh, we can test any software stack, any autonomous system, regardless of how it was done. 
So in particular, we're going to use uh, an adversarial objective of the following way is that we are going to modify the trajectories uh, of uh, a subset of the actors such that we have high loss. And this high loss is represented as um, given you know, a combination of cost and given the best trajectory that the SDB could have done, uh, how bad that is. Okay, so in that meaning, we are gonna make it um, such that the in the, in for the best trajectory that the SDB can do, it actually results in either collision or is gonna have uh, not comfort or is gonna violate traffic rules or it's gonna deviate a lot from what the humans actually did. Okay, and this is something that this combination will actually be the way that uh, we create these adversarial scenarios. And the other thing that is important is that um, since we are modifying behaviors, these behaviors should be realistic, meaning that uh, they should be physically possible, right? So you can do it with different ways, you know, a very simplistic way of uh, having physically realistic uh, behaviors is just by using a bicycle model. Uh, you can use more sophisticated models, obviously. Um, and then you want these behaviors to be, um, so this optimization is subject to the fact that you should, you know, the ob object should stay on the road, uh, should not uh, collide with other actors, <clears throat> and should maintain some kind of bounds in terms of speed, etc. Okay, and the other thing that we need to do is, uh, as I mentioned before, is re regenerate the scene. So instead of regenerating everything from simulation, here we're going to do something that is a bit faster, which is uh, we are actually going to do a composition of the real data and the simulation. Like if you remove actors, basically, given the original uh, leader point cloud, imagine that you're going to take off you know, a couple of these guys, right? So you simulate the background, you create the, uh, the shadows that were created by the actors that will not be there if you remove them, and then basically you enhance your leader. And for adding actors will be quite similar is that you uh, simulate the actors, you place them in the scene, and then you create their shadows and then you remove the data. Okay, and that's the way that you, you can mix simulation and the real world. Um, so it turns out that this actually works, uh, works really well in practice. So I'm gonna put to test uh, different uh, autonomous systems uh, from an end-to-end -end imitation learning where um, and we need to focus on the collision piece in particular, where the thing that we see is that uh, we get a much higher percentage of uh, collisions, right, uh, for the adversarial scenes than the original scenes, and much more deviation from, you know, what the human actually did. Uh, we can look at more sophisticated planners, like uh, planners like the uh, neural motion planner, and, and you can see, you know, huge, uh, uh, you know, you can really attack these systems. Uh, you can do more traditional sort of uh, PLT type planners, uh, or uh, you know this is one of our latest, greatest, more sophisticated planners that is actually very performant and very robust, uh, typically. And then you see again that the adversarial scenarios are much more difficult to handle, and you fail in quite a few of them. Um, you can use this to train the system as well. Um, and this is the performance in the original scenes as well as the adversarial. And when you train using the adversarial scenes, you basically not only get better at the adversarial scenes, but what was interesting to see is that you actually get more robust at the regular scenes as well. And that's, uh, you know, that's a great property to have. And you can, the other thing that's interesting is that you can use uh, adversarial scenes to any planner to generate new scenes to train uh, or to test the, uh, you know, the different plans, right? You don't need to miss that much. But one thing to note is that if uh, you generate the adversaries with a particular planner, uh, if you're testing the same planner, it's much more adversarial than if you're testing some other planners, right? And that's not surprising because you're directly attacking that planner. Uh, but it actually is adversarial for everybody, not just that planner. And then once you, uh, train robustly uh, with the additional data that you generate this way, then you get better for all planners. So that's also great to see. And some planners can actually generate more, uh, more adversaries versus others. Cool, so, so this is all that I have to, uh, to show you today. 
Um, so today we argue that simulation is a very important key piece uh, into both testing as well as training autonomous systems. And I focus on the four big uh, building blocks that you need for this, which are generation of the virtual worlds, the scenarios, the behaviors, as well as uh, the sensor simulation. And at the end, I show you a little bit into how you can use adversarial stuff to create scenarios that are very likely that your system actually fails. Yeah, thank you for your attention. All right, thank you, Raquel. Um, yeah, let's try to give our speakers some applause uh, virtually <laughs> on Zoom. Um, yeah, is there any questions, comments, feedbacks uh, from the audience about, about this? Well, maybe I can I can start with a question. Um, so, 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 so you talked about all of all of these four different components to make a better mm -hmm. simulation. Uh, but do you happen to have an insight of like, for instance, which one of them is more important, which one is less important? And let's say if we have a worse quality component A, like, is the world gonna be a lot different? Like, how different would it be? Are we gonna suffer from like, like which aspects in terms of performance are we going to suffer from? Yeah, great question. Um, let's see. So, I mean, you need to think about the fact that you actually need them all, right, in order to create a simulation. Now, if I were to remove one, what, which one is the least uh, important? I will say is this piece here, right? The generation of, of scenarios and and uh, is the one where, because it's only going to affect the beginning of the simulation. You know, if this guy is actually really realistic, you can sample all possible behaviors, then you can get away with a uh, less realistic here. Now, the in terms of the real, the virtual world and the sensor simulation, they are very, very tied together. So, meaning that if this guy here relies on simply rendering and then you need assets that are very, very, very realistic, right? However, if this one is actually pretty sophisticated and can handle noise, then there is less burden on this piece over here. So it really depends. Uh, and the same for here, right? So if you can simulate for a long time, then uh, you don't necessarily need a very sophisticated initialization. But if it's not the case, then everything comes here. But how, so, okay, so in general, how diverse is this, are these scenarios that you generated? Like, for instance, if you just, if you just have, let's say, five scenarios in, in your uh, code book and you start with all of just, just these five scenarios, is it going to be worse or than that having no scenario at all, or is it going to be slightly better? Uh, do you mean for the behavior simulation and yeah. for the generation? Uh, for the general, uh, like, simulation. Yeah, so I mean, uh, no scenario is the worst thing, right? So you, you need the scenarios. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, these are just random draws. So they're actually, you know, pretty, uh, it covers relatively well the long tails. Like you will, you know, and I was showing before, like U turns, um, lane changes, uh, sometimes we see some illegal maneuver. Um, and so in general, you know, they're much better than anything else in terms of you know coverage now one thing to note here is what we're doing also in the next generation is that we are making this to be uh, modifiable customizable meaning that the user will be able to say hey for this particular actor i want you to do x mm. right and by giving this ability then uh, you have a much easier way to generate you know red events to generate particular behaviors that you're interested in I see. So that's sort of like the next generation coming now, uh, but in general, you know, it's yeah, it's it's pretty decent, I would say. Nice, thank you. Compared to this scripted stuff, uh, it's night and day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Um, I'll mute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I um yeah, I think this is a great talk. Um, I have a question about this kind of, uh, maybe the connection between high fidelity simulation and adversarial simulation. So in standard uh, machine learning, we want our training distribution to be, to match our testing distribution, right? 
but maybe this is not the case for self-driving cars um, mm -hmm. because in self-driving cars we want the car to you know to perform well on those challenging scenarios right mm -hmm. so it, it's kind of a unclear if our ultimate goal is just to simulate the real data right so i wonder how do you define what is that kind of maybe the optimal distribution we want to simulate yeah fantastic question um so definitely it's not a training distribution because you want to discover mistakes and that's very very important right and typically the training distribution even if you add interventions or issues as uh, you know as people do in the industry you don't observe so many of those right um so it's important that yeah the testing distribution uh, relies more on coverage than on mimicking the statistics of the real world. Now, typically, when you're going to make your safety argument, you look at expected risk. And then, that is where the real world now comes into play. So what does it mean? It's like you need to look at for your operation domain of what you intend to, to operate. You can measure, for example, what is the probability distribution of particular scenarios happening? And for this, you typically use a representation of these scenarios that are a bit more hierarchical, the you know, scenario families, for example, they are called. And then you look at, you know, what is the distribution of each and what is your expectation of the failure for every one of these scenario types? And given these two sources of information, you can compute what is the expected risk of putting this vehicle to be autonomous in this operation domain. Okay, so at that point, then again, the real distribution of the real world actually uh, it starts, to, it starts to matter again. But it's super, super important that your testing focuses on coverage, not just on those, uh, on those statistics that maybe later you use for assessing the risk. I see. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a very important set up a, a proper metric for testing. But um, how does that translate to your simulation? So does that tell you how to you know generate your things in a specific way? Yeah, so so as I mentioned, so you can, you know, the what I presented here is the broad simulator where you can use GUI to generate the scenarios, you can use logs to generate, you know, the, the traffic, you can use any of this more sophisticated AI thing, right? And depending on your use case, you want to you wanna sample differently from this, oh, I, right? For example, if, um, you know, if you want to create a test set, I will argue that, again, you need to have a measure of coverage and then make sure that actually you um, you actually do well there and then you test there, right? If you're interested in, uh, part, you know, uh, testing a particular feature, then you will sample differently, right? You will sample the scenarios that actually test, for example, you, you change your link change uh, code, whatever, right? So you will sample with respect to this and it will be a lot of, uh, you know, you want uh, also a lot of probability mass. Right, so that you 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 know you fine grain uh, sample the the distribution of how you know all these scenarios might happen for this particular case, right? When um, you wanna you know look at the specific uh, um, if you wanna understand your failures, then you wanna poke, but poke in a way that semantically you can have information back that it's not just you fail twenty two percent of the time. But it gives you information into, okay, is your perception system cannot handle, you know, this type of vehicles, for example, pickup trucks, uh, or fails when, you know, motion planning, where this thing happens, et cetera. So you want also not just to test, but also to have a report that is intelligent, right? There is, there's many different things and, and it really depends on the use case, right? And here is all, you know, it's providing you with all the, you know, the tools, that uh, serve all these purposes. Yeah, that, that's a very nice answer. Thank you. Cool. Um, any other questions for Raquel? All right. I guess. Okay. <laughs> well, let's uh, thank Raquel again for this amazing talk.